So I want to say some things. Just reflect what's been going through my mind and offer some context that I hope everyone listening can get something from. Now, you may completely disagree with me about certain aspects. I expect that many people will. And you may be a fellow Jewish person who disagrees with me. I saw that what made me want to talk about this on here was I saw a clip earlier of a CNN anchor, Christiane Amampour, who's sort of the, you know, the doyen, the, the dignified senior international correspondent on CNN interviewing some Palestinian official, I think from the West Bank, not from Gaza, this morning. And she started it off by saying, first, before I ask you anything else, do you condemn these acts by Hamas? Will you condemn the killing of civilians, the taking of hostages, kidnapping, all that kind of stuff? And this framing of will you condemn as a precondition for being able to speak about the situation that someone should have to, and particularly a Palestinian should have to express condemnation of this or that, was very striking to me and it made me think. So I'm Jewish, not religiously, but culturally. I was raised in a culturally Jewish family, Jewish holidays were always very important. And Israel is the country that calls itself the Jewish state that was founded in the name of the Jewish people and that still calls itself the Jewish state. Now, some Jews feel different kinds of ways about that. But I went to a summer camp where the entire educational purpose was to inculcate us with a deep love for and appreciation for Israeli culture, Israeli history, and more or less the Israeli point of view on things. And many Israeli historians have come around to this view, and some of them support it. In retrospect, I'm against it, but whether you're for it or against it, it's just a fact that in order to have a Jewish demographic majority in that land, at that time, you had to commit ethnic cleansing against what's technically an indigenous population. Called, you can call them anything you want, but they call themselves the Palestinians. <laughs> Many Jews or Zionists like to say, well, there were no Palestinians. Well, maybe there were, maybe they weren't, but they were people, they were a people, and they are now the Palestinians. The core of our sympathies were with Israelis' humanity and not Palestinians' humanity, which meant that we were much more aware of the realities of life in Israel than we were of realities in life in the Palestinian occupied territories. And the Palestinian territories have been occupied by Israel for my entire lifetime, and I'm almost 50 years old. And of course, there is the historical debate of when did the occupation start? Do you want to call all of Israel an occupied territory? Blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to get into that debate right now. And Israel has occupied it militarily and ruled over it militarily. And the member, the citizens, well, <laughs> there you go. They're not citizens. They're civilians, but they're not citizens of any country. They don't have any rights. They don't, they can't vote. And in the case of the Gaza Strip for the last 20 years, they don't even have the freedom of movement. They can't fish in their own waters. All imports and exports are tightly controlled. People can't visit families only miles away in the West Bank. 70% of the people living there are refugees or the descendants of refugees, which according to international law qualifies them as refugees. 50% of the population are children. It's the area called the Gaza Strip is I think something like, I forget, what the total square mileage is, but it's like 25 miles long and 7.5 miles at its widest. It's a tiny, tiny strip of land with 2.5 million people, half of them children, 70% of them refugees. And it's the most concentrated strip of land on earth as far as I know, or one of them. And it's been called not by some wild anti-Semite, but by 
a very prominent Israeli sociologist named Baruch Kimmerling, who's, who passed away since then, he called it the world's, the largest concentration camp ever built. David Cameron, the former British prime minister, called it the world's largest open air prison. And by any standards, that's what it is. When people can't move, they can't control the flow of their own resources. They're put on a starvation diet, just kept alive. And Israeli governments have explicitly advocated and stated this policy. And that's even without counting the fact that every so often and increasingly often, Israel will conduct a bombing campaign to supposedly punish the Palestinians for their leadership's crimes. Uh, bombing hospitals, bombing apartment buildings. So all of this is the context, is the background to all of this. And it's just a fact. And you can, you can come with sort of more context about Israel's attempts at making peace over the years, and I would argue with you about that, but that's fine. Even if that's true, the facts as I've stated them, I think are pretty uncontroversial, that the Palestinians in Gaza especially, the West Bank Palestinians are dealing with their own set of, of circumstances and problems, but it's different, but connected, because they are one people, separated geographically. But so you have basically a concentration camp, and I know that term is triggering potentially because we know we all know what we typically associate yeah, and someone's mentioning very limited access to water and electricity i've heard something like 95 percent of the water in gaza is not fit to drink according to international authorities and israel shuts off the electricity whenever it wants and if people want to say, well, no, but the Palestinian Authority controls things. Yeah, but who's the Palestinian Authority working for? The Palestinian Authority has no autonomy whatsoever. And it was designed that way. And all occupying powers would rather farm out their dirty work to the native population. It's been, you know, the British have done it, you know, ever since, you know, the Indian colonies. In India, that is. So... Anyway, I was saying about the word concentration camp. We all know what the associations are, right? Well, it's with the concentration camps that my great-grandparents died in, that my great-aunt almost died in, barely survived, that my father and grandfather and grandmother were extremely fortunate not to be sent, and, sent to and killed in. You know? So my entire family was decimated and partly wiped out and... Auschwitz was the spot, and that's the world's most famous concentration camp. So to hear me describe Gaza as a concentration camp might be shocking or, or worse. I think it's an appropriate term. People are certainly concentrated, and they can't leave, so it's a concentration camp. But if you don't like that, just call it an open-air prison. It's no better. So you have this situation where this, there's this permanent state of play where these 2.5 million people are, are, are caged and their only crime I mean if we call it an open air prison well then the question is what's their crime why are they in prison what is the crime that every person born in Gaza every person living in Gaza has committed to end up in the world's largest open air prison slash concentration camp the crime of being Palestinian and being born in Gaza that's it Literally, there is no other crime. Now, Israel wants to say that when it goes and bombs Gaza, they're, do they're punishing the people for the terrorist crimes of their leaders, Hamas. Now, Hamas came to power in 2006 in what Jimmy Carter called the Middle East's freest and fairest elections in decades. They, you know, Israel allowed elections, had nominally withdrawn and Hamas was democratically elected. Now, you may not like that, just like many people didn't like that Trump was democratically elected. That's what democracy is. Now, again, you can argue about the, whether there was election interference, blah, blah, blah. I'm not getting into that right now. But in the case of Hamas, there was no election interference. The Carter Foundation for Peace and Democracy, I think that's what it's called, who, which monitors elections, really declared it a truly fair election. So ever since then, Israel and the United States said, nope, 
we don't accept the results of your democratic process, and they started, and they fomented a coup. And ever since then, Gaza has been under this terrible siege. And occasionally Hamas sends, until now, the rockets that Hamas has sent have been very ineffective. This, maybe they've terrorized Israelis, terrorized, Israelis have been scared, but very few Israeli civilians have died and even very few soldiers have died. The balance of deaths over the last however long has been inordinately tilted towards Palestinian casualties and huge amounts of civilians for the crime of being born in the world's largest prison camp. And we all know that collective punishment is a human rights crime under international law as well, so it's not even a justification. So, what about this business of demanding that a Palestinian condemn these actions? Well, what about any of us condemning them? Well, I think we have to think about what it means to condemn something. Now, I think we should state the obvious. These are horrible things. It's horrible to see young people killed at a music festival. It's horrible. I don't like it. I'm against it. I am against it. I don't like it. If you put me, if there was a vote tomorrow about whether I think, whether I'd like to live in a world on a planet where young people get killed at music festivals, I would line up at, at three in the morning to be the first to vote against it. In my world, my moral universe, the world I'd like to live in, that shouldn't happen. But to condemn something, I just don't know really what that means, actually. Beyond saying, I don't like it, it's bad, it makes me feel bad. Because if you're going to go farther and say, it's wrong, it shouldn't have happened, well, then you'd better take the entire context into account. And that's what I'm not seeing. I'm seeing a lot of politicians, including our most so-called progressive politicians, Bernie, AOC, Jagmeet Singh in Canada, even the new mayor of Manitoba, Wab Kinu, the indigenous premier, sorry, of Manitoba, just coming out with a full-scale condemnation of, of Hamas's actions here. Okay, well then what you're saying is, what that actually means, if it doesn't just mean I don't like it, it's bad, boo. What you're saying is, given the entire context, I think they should have done something else. And I'm going to put myself in a position where I condemn it. I have the moral standing to say, y'all shouldn't have done that. Okay, that's fine if you want to say that, but none of these people, and very few of us, seemingly, have any idea or any interest in having any idea in the context. Because when you put it in the context, I'm not saying it makes it right. Like I said, nothing could convince me that it's a good thing that young people die at music festivals. But let's look at that music festival. Just, just put it in some context not to justify it we don't it's not who cares if we justify it or not we can't i mean never mind who cares it's just it makes no difference to condemn it or justify it really and it's wrong it's bad it's terrible it's horrible and my heart goes out to the families and to those young people who lost their lives as individuals they didn't deserve it no one deserves that but think about this for a second there is a music festival a rave going on on the very outskirts, on the very outside of a cage. These young people who are free, most of them are Jewish, which is what grants them that, their freedom in that country, but they certainly aren't born with the crime of being Palestinian. They have the freedom to go to a music festival and take ecstasy or do whatever they're doing and dance to, to EDM. And they're exercising that freedom and they're partying. Now, they don't deserve to be punished for partying. It's not a crime to party. And they, none of them did anything that day to deserve what happened. But they were knowingly partying right next to a concentration camp. Now, just put that in any other context. 
if you take everything I've said so far to be factual, and I believe it is, then take that scenario and put it in any other context. And I don't have to tell you which context comes to mind for me when I think about the idea of a party being held by the occupying powers, young people, having fun and partying and getting down and having a great time and even praying for peace and, you know, feeling good on the outskirts of a concentration camp. Just imagine that for a second, okay? Well, there is something obscene about that, isn't there? There's just something obscene about that being the case. That doesn't make the individuals who attended morally culpable. But either they're knowingly doing it or they're unknowingly do it. And I'm not sure which is worse. But the fact is a lot of Israelis are able to go through their lives not knowing about what the Palestinians are living through. And frankly, it's easier not to care. And that's true for all of us in our own ways. So you have this party on the outskirts of a concentration camp. Well, what does that communicate to the people in the concentration camp? How valuable are their lives? Okay. Now, so I said it doesn't make it justified. What I think it makes it is un inevitable. And there's a big difference between inevitability and justification. Inevitability is just about reality and the rules of reality. Justification is about right and wrong. You could even say that Hamas's methods were way too brutal, that it's going to backfire, that the people who carried out that particular crime should be tried and punished. I still don't think that addresses the question, what did you expect would happen if you caged people like this for so long? What do you expect? Which really comes down to the question, as one of my favorite thinkers puts it, Norman Finkelstein, a fellow Jew, a fellow son of Holocaust victims and survivors, says, do the Palestinians have the moral responsibility and obligation to just lay down and die? Is that their lot in life? Is that what the moral thing to do is for them? Is just to lay down and die, just accept it? Well, you might say, it would be a reasonable thing to say, well, what about nonviolent protest? Haven't they tried that? Where's the Palestinian Gandhi? Where's the Mal Palestinian MLK? We hear this all the time. Problem is they've tried that. I believe it was 2018. There was something called the Great March of Return, where droves of Palestinians marched upon the illegal and oppressive border fence that the, the walls of their prison, basically, on which towers are Israeli snipers who can shoot them from miles away and do at the slightest provocation. And they marched peacefully on it and they got mowed down. They got just picked off one by one. And there were Israelis, civilians, who sat out on the hills nearby and watched it and cheered and drank beers. There's video of it, there's pictures of it, okay? So today we see Israeli civilians being brutalized and many mistreated, some killed, kidnapped. We don't know what else. I'm not exactly clear on what's true and what's doctored in terms of the footage, but clearly Israeli civilians are suffering and it's horrible. But if we put it in a larger context, the Israeli civilian population has at least been a party to and an accomplice to some major crimes against humanity for a long time. That does not mean these people deserve to die. I'm not talking about justification. I'm talking about what's predictable, what's inevitable. Unless you think that the Palestinians have the obligation to lie down and die peacefully, because clearly when they try to be nonviolent, a, the Israelis shoot them down, and B, the world basically ignores it. And often our countries, the West, Canada, the United States, will still come down on Israel's side. They may issue, you know, they may cluck their tongues and say, oh, Israel went too far. But you'll never see them strongly do anything to support 
or insist on an end to the occupation. And we could tomorrow, because we're the ones who fund it, billions of dollars a year. Billions of dollars a year to support this administration of this cruel prison system that's enslaving an entire people. And as someone else pointed out, nonviolence only works if anyone's watching. I mean, what MLK and others advocated in Selma was only a viable tactic because the world was watching. That's what they were counting on. You go slack, you don't offer any resistance, you let the dogs and the water hoses do their thing to you, and the world will see and the conscience of the nation will be, will be roused and the thing will end. And you know what? In a lot of ways it worked. The problem is the Palestinians have been doing that for a long time, sometimes violently, sometimes not so violently, and nothing has changed. So again, what is predictable? What is inevitable? And this is context. Everything arises in a context. And you can condemn the content as much as you want. But to me, there's actually something obscene about insisting that a Palestinian, like Christina Mopur did, insisting that before a Palestinian gets to speak about why this is happening and what the meaning of it is, that they must say, well, first of all, do you think it's wrong? They would never ask an Israeli before they can comment on anything to do with the situation. Do you condemn the jailing of 2.5 million people in a concentration camp? They would never ask that. They would just ask, how are you doing? I saw a headline in CTV News out of Montreal that said, and literally, I don't exactly know the numbers, but this is literally how it was constructed. 75 killed in Israel, 148 dead in Gaza. 75 killed, 148 dead. Do you hear the difference? That was in the same headline. Not even like two headlines a few hours apart. The same headline made very clear that when Israelis die, they have been killed, they have been murdered. Someone killed them. When Palestinians die, eh, their time was up. And it's so, I mean, I want to call it subtle, but in that case, it's not subtle at all. At least be honest, okay? Anti-Semitism is a whole different issue than an entire people who did nothing to harm us to begin with. They had nothing to do with the Holocaust. Don't, te don't tell me about the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. Sorry. The Palestinians are not responsible for my great-grandparents' death. Them doing whatever they think is necessary based on their experience to try and get some modicum of freedom or even attention, even if it's brutal, even if it's criminal. Comparing that to an irrational hatred of Jews that goes back centuries is, I think that's a desecration of the memory of my ancestors who died. At least I, I take it to be very offensive and I think we should be careful not to fall into that. So what do I wanna to say to sum up? Because it's getting dark here and I'm running out of things to say. I've been going for long enough. Okay, so someone says Hamas is a group that hates Jews. Well, let's say they do hate Jews. Let's say that, that Hamas, a lot of Hamas members hate Jews. And by the way, I have Jewish friends who have visited Gaza and were treated very well by Hamas, or at least militants there. And certainly by the people, because the people of Gaza are not Hamas. But let's say some Palestinians are anti-Semites now. They hate Jews, okay? I still insist on a major moral difference between that quote-unquote anti-Semitism and say, if I go to Louisiana and walk into a cafe and someone looks at me and says, get out of here, Jew. Because in that situation, I did nothing to harm that man and all of his hatred of me is based on his ideas about me and I'm not a real threat to his family or to his livelihood or his way of life. He swallowed a poisonous, hateful, a completely irrational hatred. You know, I'm betting that a lot of my ancestors, in fact, I don't even have to bet. 
My grandparents hated Germans until the day they died. Doesn't mean they couldn't have a conversation with a German, but deep down, German was not something they felt very friendly towards. The language didn't sound good to them, sounded evil, sounded dangerous, threatening. When people have a certain experience, when every Jew you've ever met was a soldier banging on your door to take your son or daughter away to be incarcerated or tortured, and yes, this happens, folks, a lot. When the Jew, when the association you have with Jews is a Jewish flag flying at the top of the wall that borders your cage, and the country that has a leader that goes on on television every day and in the name of Jewish people justifies the killing of your mother or your son or the leveling of your apartment building. Or, I mean, again, if you don't know what the Palestinians have been through and are going through, I don't think you have the right, frankly, the moral right to pronounce judgment full stop on Palestinians' dislike of Jews. And I think most Palestinians are actually sophisticated enough to understand that it's not all Jews. It may be, it's not even all Israelis. But I wouldn't blame them if they didn't. I wouldn't agree with them, but I wouldn't think it would be appropriate or my job to like say, actually, you know what, it's not all Jews. In their position, I might think the same thing. I might think the same thing. And, and that to me is the basis of real morality. So if we're gonna talk, I saw Mehdi Hassan from MSNBC today talking about ultimately this conflict is about morality. Well, if it's about morality, then we have to ask ourselves, what would I do in their position? Because the fundamental moral principle is, we all know it, the golden rule. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. But that also means, think of how you would do under their circumstances. And most people don't wanna deal with that thought experiment, because that's really uncomfortable. There's no real compassion without understanding where someone's coming from and what they've been through. And I think the same is true of political moralizing. And resistances can be brutal. And the more brutal oppression is, the more out of control and chaotic and horrible and dangerous to innocent people it'll be when it explodes I think history teaches that and that doesn't make it right and if I was a Palestinian maybe I would think I have the right to say I think Hamas made a mistake here but of course I don't like the situation and my heart does go out for the, 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 the genuine fears and grief of Israelis who have lost people or are afraid of losing people or their own lives but I also think we have to take a look at if we really condemn it, if we really morally condemn it, we have to ask why did it happen and what needs to happen so that it never happens again. And the truth is that any answer to that question other than the occupation has to end and the siege of Gaza has to end and the people of Gaza and the West Bank have to be free in one form or another, whether it's a two-state solution or a one-state solution or whatever you want to call it, but that prison camp needs to be closed forever and the people let out to live as a, a people among the peoples of the world. Any solution short of that, you're actually not serious about this never happening again. You just want the Palestinians to go away or to sub sublimate their humanity and be nice and polite and not bother anyone. Well, I, I, I refuse to accept the idea that they have the obligation to do that for us to make our lives or Israelis' lives easier, frankly, because there are consequences to oppression and occupation, which are also international crimes. What did I think Hamas, what did Hamas think would happen after Saturday? I have no idea. That's what I don't know. I'm sure they knew. I, I, I have to guess that they knew Israel would come with everything they've got and declare war. I mean, it was a shocking loss for Israel something like 13 of their senior commanders in the south were captured or killed. Humiliating and shocking. It's nothing like this has happened since the 1973 war, which was 50 years ago last week. 
So I think Hamas had to know that, I mean, Israel responds to the slightest prov provocation to go in with aerial bombardments and explosives and wreak havoc. They call it mowing the lawn. That's the term for it in Hebrew, mowing the lawn. And they do it every few years just to remind the Palestinians. And they, again, I'm quoting Israeli officials here, just to remind the Palestinians who's boss. So Hamas had to know. And what that tells me is either they're just psychos or maybe either they have a death wish and it's like suicide by cop on a large scale or at least part of it is they figured it was worth it because they have nothing left to lose. Another thing I've mentioned, didn't mention is that Israel's government in the past year has become the most racist in its history. I mean, we're talking about ministers and politicians and government officials who will live in the Knesset, in the parliament, say things that would have made the Nazis blush. And today they were talking about, we need a second Nakba. The Nakba is the, what the Palestinians call their catastrophe in 1948, where many were expelled or killed, the ethnic cleansing. And they're saying, we need a second one. And I've seen North American Jews saying the same thing. I saw Nikki Haley, that Republican reptile, say, finish them, wipe them out. Netanyahu said, the Palestinians better run and hide. Run where? They'll get shot if they try to leave by ocean. They can't breach. They're in a prison. So I think Hamas must have made the calculation, and they must have been planning this for a long time, too. If you look at the coordination of it, it took a lot of planning. Again, a shocking level of sophistication and, and, and planning. And I guess their calculation was it's better than nothing because either we keep dying a slow death or we stand up and do something to show the world that we're still here and we're not going anywhere. I'm not saying that's right, but on some level, I'd be lying if I didn't say it was understandable. Worst case scenario, they probably thought we might get nuked. And they decided, you know, we'll let God decide. And I'm not saying it was right of them to make that decision for everyone in Gaza either. Some people close to me who were very sympathetic to my point of view said, yeah, but they don't have the right to impose that, those consequences on the Palestinians. I don't know what to say about that. It's true. At the same time, the chances of any kind of democratic decision-making process have been destroyed from the outside on purpose. Like I said, the siege started when the West, Israel and the United States and Canada rejected the Palestinians' democratic will in 2006 when they elected Hamas. A right, the person who says Palestinians, including Jews and other religious groups, coexisted for centuries prior to the Balfour Declaration. It's absolutely true. It's absolutely false to frame this as a religious war. It's just not true. Jews and Palestinians, although the, of course the Jews were Palestinians and that they lived in Palestine. Jews and Arabs have lived together on that land, coexisted for a long, long time. Probably the Christians were their common enemy, not each other. Please don't let anti-Semitism or Islamophobia take over. Absolutely. That's just, we lose the minute we make this about religion. It's not about religion. There's nothing about Judaism and Islam that says there should be a conflict, you know. And people who say, well, Hamas wants to throw all the Jews into the sea. Well, maybe they do. But Israel has systematically rejected and destroyed any attempt at nonviolent negotiation for a long, long time. And there are many Palestinians, many, many, many Palestinians, and they've been polled about this, who have no animus towards Jews in particular. They just want to have some equality with Israelis. And that's what brings about the idea of a one-state solution from the river to the sea. Equal rights for all. It would mean the end of a Jewish state per se, but it could be a binational state. Anyway, that's a longer-term thing. I'm not going to get into that. I don't know what the right solution is. I don't know what's realistic.